Hi there. Uh, editor's note from Future Rob. So, this episode has low audio quality. Thanks for hanging in with us. It's entirely my fault. I was recording on the wrong microphone input, which will get funny towards the end. But hopefully you can live with that. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Let's Put on a Show, a show about musicals, theater, and musical theater, featuring someone who's not super into any of those things. Someone who really, really is. Someone who's in the middle. We're back, baby! It's been a bit because I have been lazy and or busy. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we were, yeah, what, 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 what are we doing? Um, we are doing You're in Town Musical. Um, at the Axe Theater here in Seattle. As opposed to You're in Town, the hard-hitting drama. I mean, if you took out the music, it would be pretty fucking weird. Yeah. Uh, okay, so first of all, this is a very important thing. If you have not seen You're in Town, spoiler alert. Oh. Ooh. It's my sister, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes? Not too awfully. I mean, I would appreciate a ride home, but... Every week's always been there in somebody else's place. Let's go with her. We, we, can, we can get ourselves home. Like, I wonder if I can get people to do ASMR tingles by rubbing my beard on the mic thing. Oh, God. Ooh. You're welcome. I'll... I feel it. That's okay. You guys take care of you. And meanwhile, we're recording a podcast right now. And Are we, though? Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any scissors? We can do the, like, we can do the, like, cutting of the beard as an ASMR thing. No. Yeah, I'm not going to cut my actual beard. Don't be crazy. <laughs> Anyway, so we saw, we saw you're in town. You want your cold open? I got your cold open right here. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we saw you're in town at uh, Act Theater. You're in beautiful, sunny Seattle. This time it's ironic because it's night. Um, Act Theater is, I've, I think I've gone on record as saying my favorite theater here in Seattle. Yeah, I think you have. Just because they're the ones that do all the weird shit. And I'm into the weird shit. We do the weird shit. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Like, if, if any if any theater in Seattle was going to do, like, a grimy, low-budget adaptation of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog for the stage, it would be them. Oh, it totally would. And it, it would wouldn't be, be low amazing. Budget. It would be great. It wouldn't be low-budget. It would be fully funded. True, but it would still be grimy. Yeah. And, and that's what matters. Of, right. It's, <laughs> it's art ain't art until it's grimy. <laughs> anyway, speaking of grime, uh, you're in town. So... In the past, we talked about how we're going to power through the, pl the play story, and then we have not done that. We're going to actually commit to doing that from this moment forward, and so here to read the summary of the play from Wikipedia, spoilers fully intact, is our own David. Act 1. The show opens with a grim welcome from Officer Lockstock, a policeman, assisted by the street urchin Little Sally. According to Lockstock and Little Sally, a 20-year drought has caused a terrible water shortage, making private toilets unthinkable. All restroom activities are done in public toilets controlled by a mega corporation called Urine Good Company, or UGC. To control water consumption, people have to pay to use amenities. Song, too much exposition. There are harsh laws ensuring that people pay to urinate, and if the laws are broken, the offender is sent to a penal colony called Urine Town, yeah. never to return. The oppressed masses huddle in a line at the poorest, filthiest urinal in town. Public Amenity Number 9, which is run by the rigid, harshly authoritarian Penelope Pennywise and her assistant, dashing young everyman Bobby Strong. Trouble ensues when Bobby's father, Old Man Strong, cannot afford his urinal admission for the day and asks Pennywise to let him go free just this once. After Old Man Strong's plea is dismissed, it's a privilege to pee, song, he urinates on the street and is soon arrested by officers Lockstock and Barrel and escorted to urine town. It's a privilege to pee, reprise. Later that day, in the corporate offices of Urine Good Company, the CEO, Caldwell B. Cladwell, is discussing the new fee hikes with Senator Phipp, a politician firmly in Cladwell's pocket. When Cladwell's beautiful daughter, Hope Cladwell, arrives on the scene as UGC's new fax copy girl, by way of introduction, the UGC staff sing a song in praise of their chief, Mr. Cladwell. Uh, song, Mr. Cladwell. Officers Lock, Stock, and Barrel discuss the journey to Urine Town and how it reduces everyone, even the toughest, to screams. Song, the cop song. 
Hope enters and encounters Bobby Strong. Bobby, distraught over his father's arrest and wondering if he could have done something, tells Hope that his heart feels either cold or empty. Hope tells Bobby that the only answer is to follow his heart. The two realize that they both want a new world where people can be happy and pee for free and united by their belief, fall in love. Song, follow your heart. Little Sally asks Officer Lockstock what year in town is like, but Lockstock replies that its power lies in its mystery and he cannot flippantly reveal that there is no year in town, we just kill people! And that reveal will not come until Act 2, with everybody singing and things like that. <clears throat> the next day, Cladwell's assistant, Mr. McQueen, announces the new fee hike set upon the urinals. Bobby concludes that the laws are wrong, opening the doors of the urinal despite Miss Pennywise's protests. He begins a pee-for-free rebellion song, Look at the Sky. Pennywise rushes to the offices of UGC, where she informs Cladwell of the revolution. The two give each other long, meaningful looks, but they are interrupted by, by the situation at hand. Cladwell vows to crush the rebellion, frightening Hope. Cladwell, by way of a series of increasingly convoluted metaphors involving a bunny, tells Hope that their privilege and responsibility to stomp on the poor. Song, Don't Be the Bunny. Cladwell, McQueen, Fip, Pennywise, Lock, Stock, and Barrel arrive at Amenity No. 9 to snuff out the uprising. Bobby learns that Hope is Cladwell's daughter. Bobby realizes the only way out of the trap is to kidnap Hope to use his leverage against Cladwell. The rebel poor escape with Hope as their hostage. The police give chase, but the slow-motion choreography makes it impossible for the police to catch them. Lockstock vows to catch the poor as he tells the audience to enjoy intermission. Song, Act 1 finale. <clears throat> Act 2. Lockstock welcomes everyone back. He catches the audience up on the situation and tells them that the rebel poor are holed up in a secret hideout somewhere, gesturing to a large sign that reads, Secret Hideout. The sign leads to the sewers where the rebels are holding Hope hostage. The rebels wonder what year in town is, and two of them, Little Becky Two-Shoes and Hot Blades Harry, explain their theories. Cladwell orders Lockstock to search harder for the rebels, threatening that he will send everyone to year in town if Hope is not found. Bobby and his mother Josephine hand out memos to the other assistant custodians in the hopes that they will join them. Bobby is sure that year in town is nothing but a lie designed to keep the poor people in fear. Lockstock catches a little Sally, but she is unfazed by his threat of year in town, because as she sees it, they are already in year in town. It isn't so much a place as it is a metaphysical place that they are all in, including Lockstock. She escapes before Lockstock can ask her what metaphysical means. Song, what is urine town? Convinced that Bobby, Josephine, and Little Sally have been captured, the rebels, particularly Hot Blaze Harry and Little Becky Two-Shoes, decide that the best way to get revenge on Cladwell is to kill Hope. Song, snuff that girl. They are about to kill her when Bobby bursts in and reminds the rebels that their purpose is more than just revenge. He explains that he made a promise to all the people of the land that all the people of the land would be free. One of the rebels reminds Bobby that the only words he said were, run, everybody, run for your lives, run. Bobby explains that in the heat of battle, the cry of freedom sounds something like, song, run, freedom, run. Invigorated by the poor, invigorated, the poor rally around Bobby, but balk at a statement that the violent fight could take decades. Just then, Pennywise bursts into the secret hideout, telling Bobby that Cladwell wants him to come to the UGC headquarters. Bobby goes, but only after being reminded by impatient rebels that if anything happens to him, Hope will be killed. Pennywise fiercely swears that if any of the rebels harm Hope, she will have Bobby sent off the year in town. Bobby says goodbye to Hope, apologizes, and tells her to think of what they have. Song, follow your heart reprise. At the UGC headquarters, Bobby is offered a suitcase full of cash and full amnesty to the rebels as long as Hope is returned and the people agree to new fee hikes. Bobby refuses and demands free access for the people. Cladwell orders the cops to escort Bobby to year in town, even if it means that the rebel poor will kill Hope. Horrified, Pennywise marvels at the depths of Cladwell's evil. Cladwell has her arrested as well. She, Hope, and Fip sing of their regrets of falling for Cladwell's schemes. Meanwhile, Bobby is led to the top of the UGC building and learns the truth. You're in town as death. Bobby regrets ever having listened to his heart. Lock, stock, and barrel throw him off the building. Song, Why Did I Listen to That Man? Killing him. Little Sally returns to the hideout in a shocked daze, having just heard Bobby's last words. The ghost of Bobby sings, along with Little Sally, his last words, which are directed to Hope. Song, Tell Her I Love Her. His last words encourage the rebels to fight for what they know is right, and that the time is always now. Just as the rebels are about to murder Hope in revenge, Pennywise enters and offers herself instead, proclaiming herself to be Hope's mother. The poor reel back, shocked by this unexpected twist. Hope convinces the rebels to let her lead them, and she, Penny, and the poor march on the offices of UGC. On the way, they kill Officer Beryl, who had just confessed his love to Officer Lockstock, Senator Phipp, and Mrs. Millennium. Song, We're Not Sorry. 
Hope reveals to her father that she is still alive. Cladwell is overjoyed until the rest of the poor reveal themselves. Hope tells him that his reign of terror is over and that he will be sent to the same place he sent Bobby and all those who couldn't or wouldn't meet cr the criminal fee hikes. Cladwell pleads to the people that he is their only chance at seeing tomorrow, but it's no use. Pennywise and Cladwell reminisce about their past romance. Song, we're not sorry, reprise. Cladwell is led to the roof, shouting that he regrets nothing, and however cruel he might have been, he kept the pee off the street and the water in the ground. He's thrown off. With the town at peace at last, the age of fear is over, and the people look forward to a bright new day. The year in good company is renamed the Bobby Strong Memorial Toilet Authority, and the people are henceforth allowed to pee whenever they like, as much as they like, for as long as they like, with whomever they like. Song, I See a River. However, the town's newfound urinary bliss is short-lived, as its limited water supply quickly disappears. Lockstock tells the audience that, as draconian as the UGC's rules were, they kept the people from squandering the limited water supply. Now, much of the population dies of thirst. It is insinuated that Hope suffers a terrible death at the hand of the people for her actions in depleting the water supply. But the remaining townsfolk will wage on their town not quite like the imaginary urine town with which they had been threatened for years. Pale Malthus. So, yeah. Uh, that was a lot of front-loaded exposition. And nothing kills a show like too much exposition, so I might chop that up. Or a but, bad title. Or a bad title, yeah. Or bad subject matter. Mm. Anyhow, so, uh, let's dive in. So, What's the first thing anyone has to say? I just want to run over the cast real quick. All right. And um, yeah, well, that's a good idea. While we're here. Yeah. Um, so the cast in alphabetical order oh. um, of the actors. Um, so Soupy Sue and others is played by Andy ha uh, Andy Hatta. Uh, Caldwell B. Cladwell is Kurt Be Beatty or Beatty? Uh, probably Beatty. Beatty. And I, I'd like to comment on him. So it might have just been where we were sitting, but... Homeboy needs, uh, like, Homeboy spits a lot yeah. when, when he sings, when he talks. Yeah, some actors do. Some actors do, but in this case it really works because it, it's kind of like, um, have you guys read Dune? Yes, yes. Okay, so you know how Muad'Dib gets his, like, his amazing uh, uh, reputation from being someone who gives water to the dead mm -hmm. because he cries at a funeral? Yeah. So it's kind of like that where it's just showing off how decadent he is, that he can be just spitting everywhere and, like, he has all the fresh water he would ever need. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I thought no, that was fine. a fun thing. No, you're fine. He was fantastic. He was very, uh, very good. Very evil. Hope is played by Sarah Rose Davis. Senator Phipp is played by Chris Ensweiler. Bobby Strong is Miko Juan. Joseph Oldman Strong and Hot Blades Harry, they doubled a lot of people, is Brian Lang. Uh, Josephine is Leslie Law. Little Sally was Arika Matoba. Which, okay, I would like to comment on her, too. Arika Matoba is fucking tiny. Oh yeah, like she she's is, little. She is itty bitty. Like she, she's I, an old, adult woman she's playing an adult woman. a somewhere between five and eleven year old girl. And like pulling it off because like I'm fairly certain that I could trust her about as far as I could throw her. Not because I don't trust her, but because I could like fling her like a stack of potatoes. Yeah, a stack. 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 I know. I said I said stack though. Okay. How does one um, stack potato? I don't know. I think kind of a log cabin formation. Yeah. Sorry, go on. So, <laughs> Miss Pennywise is played by Mari Nelson. Officer Lockstock is Brandon O'Neill. Officer Barrel is Matthew Posner. Little Becky Two Shoes is Sarah Russell. And Mr. McQueen is Nathaniel Tenenbaum. Okay, so those last two. Uh, Little Susie Two Shoes was uh, the one that was like all gung ho to kill people, right? Yeah, they were the two that sang Snuff the Girl. Okay, so. I wonder mm -hmm. if they did her makeup and then realized how much she looked like Tim Curry and she decided to do a Tim Curry impression. Oh, no, that that's Andy El Haddaf. That's Andy El Haddaf? Yeah. Okay. That's Soupy Sue. Soupy Sue. Okay, Soupy Sue. I wonder if they, what I said, or if she decided to do a Tim Curry impression and then they made her look like uh, uh, Frankenfurter. <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. But it, it's like... It's uncanny. I didn't even think about that until you brought it yeah, up. Like, like, oh my god. She looks exactly like, if if there was a female Frankenfurter, then that would be... I was going to say, I know that, a couple female Franks, that, but... Well, then there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that is our cast, and um, just going to get this out of the way, I have a huge crush on Brandon O'Neill. Surprising absolutely nobody. I get it. Yeah. Uh... It, yeah, he, and he was really good. He's Officer Lockstock, yeah. and he's, you know, the narrator of the play, and gets some of the, like, more fun things to do, because it's always kind of fun to play a bastard. Mm -hmm. 
but he also like leaps from the audience onto the stage. Mm-hmm. He has like one of the best parts of the show. In my yeah, opinion. he has like <laughs> probably the standout part. Full disclosure: Lane and I have both done this show at different points in our life. I have not. This this was my first time seeing it. And I, I thought it was I thought it was really good. I, I, I knew what the twists were beforehand, like both of them. But I thought uh, that honestly just kind of made it better for me on mm-hmm. some levels because I could see like, oh, this is how it all goes wrong. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Um, yeah. But like my favorite was his delivery of there is no urine town. We just kill people. Yeah. And it's like that's an interesting one, because like this play is very, very meta. Oh, good lord, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's in it's, a very contained way. So, I, I was actually talking about this um, with a friend, how it's just incredibly Brechtian. Uh, Bertolt Brecht was a director, um, and he had this belief that the audience should constantly be aware that they are in a theater out of play. And so everything is heightened and over-the-top and self-referential, and like he's also considered the father of meta theater, mm. um, at least to me. And he, so when when I call something Brechtian, I mean it's very aware of itself and makes you that aware that it is aware of itself. It's also just very big. Yeah, for being in in such a tiny theater, it was a very big show. Oh yeah. And just like, everyone is very big. Like, everything is very stagey. There's there's not really any naturalistic acting. Because there, yeah. doesn't, there doesn't have to be. Cause it you're... doesn't need it. No, these characters are not nuanced. It's it's sort of like... Uh, so basically, it's like kind of a pantomime morality play for kids, but the moral is horrific. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, the moral is basically like uh, a fascist oligarchy driven by profit is better than no government at all, (laughs) which is an interesting lesson. (laughs) Yeah, Rob and I actually got to attend a talk back for this show. Yeah, it was was interesting. Um, And uh, it was Brandon O'Neill, Sarah Rose Davis, Chris Ensweiler, and Brian Lang. Yeah, Brian Brian Lang was very funny. He he seemed very nice. Yeah, they they were all great. Oh, yeah. Um, And just, they were, like... I think it was Brandon O'Neill brought up that how Brechtian the show was, and mm-hmm. I was just kind of saying, like, going, damn it, he's smart too. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was just very, like, cool for them to talk about, like, how they perceive the characters and, like, just the technical thing of having a show written for a cast of 22 played by 13 actors. Yeah, and, like, once or twice they they reference it in lines that I, I bet weren't in the original. Like, I, I haven't seen the original, clearly. Well, what's the line? Uh, like, get him, man! <laughs> like, or like, uh, well, no, no, you'll no, have no, to that's... face my man! And it's just one No, that's guy. how it is. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah because it worked you're out supposed really to well. have, the chorus is the poor people. Yeah. Except for the one number where everyone has the cop uniforms. Yeah, and that's the thing, is like, the entire chorus switches back and forth a lot. Between yeah. like yeah. between UGC employees and poor people, which basically means switching between uh, Whoville does the Third Reich and Whoville does the Great Depression. Because <laughs> 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 like, all all of the all of the like uh, all of the police officers are basically in Gestapo uniforms. Or not even Gestapo. No, yeah, like, like yeah. early Gestapo. Gestapo before with they... a weird bondage twist. Yeah, Gestapo before they got the Hugo Boss and they were all just wearing, like, dumb shirts and, and like, you know, snappy trousers. And, uh, and all of the poor people are just so cartoonishly impoverished. Like, it's, you know, I mean, they're, it, it fits because they're literally saving pennies to go to a public toilet. Mm-hmm. Like, and as as it, it, at one point brought up, like sometimes the show needs to be about one big thing instead of being about a bunch of other stuff, because like it's laser focused the entire play, the entire message of the play on not message but like the kind of theme of the play on urination. Like I think they bring up poop once, yeah, <laughs> exactly once, and like no one is short on water. I guess. Like, no one ever complains about being thirsty until the very end. Well, no. Pennywise has a line about, um, I take my showers in a coffee cup and then boil the rest of it for tea. 
Yeah, but like that's the one time it's brought up. Like they there's a water shortage, but no one's thirsty. There's mm -hmm. no food shortage. Everyone seems to have like plenty to eat. It's only the urination that it brings up. And that's also just kind of contributes to the sort of stylism of the like Saturday morning cartoon on mescaline. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where it's like it's like how in, like, old cartoons that are, like, anti-drug, it's never a real drug. Or, like, they only bring up drugs in general. Mm -hmm. And whenever they show drugs, it's, like, very weirdly, like, not representative of paraphernalia at yeah, all. drugs with mm -hmm. a capital D. Yeah, it's like, hey, man, you want to try some drugs? And holds up, like... A joint in a way that nobody ever holds a joint. It, yeah, like, as John Mulaney says, a joint that no one would ever hold that way. But, or, like, just sort of this, like... It might be a bong, but it just looks like a weird, like, sewer pipe. Like, you know, it, it's Is that it kind a of... a sewer pipe or it's a dildo? Like, no one will ever know. Coming soon, the sewer dildo. Oh, no. Nope, nope, nope. Hated, nope, nope, nope. hated nope. it as soon as I said it. Okay. Anyway. Um. <laughs> so, yeah. one, one cool thing is, like, so there's a it's point like... when Bobby and his mom are, are di distributing the pamphlets. Yeah. And then um we had the fortune to be sitting in the in the first row which the way the the Falls Theater is where we were we yeah. were in the Falls, right? I don't know. Uh we were at the Act the, Theater. The lower theater cuz the there's like act. eight different spaces in there. Yeah. Um I think which it's is, the Falls. Yeah. Um which I where believe is also the stage is at the bottom and the audience is raked up from there. Which is where That's we where saw uh you know, uh, ride the cyclone. Yeah, my yeah they're in the same theater. Yeah, my wife who ride the cyclone. Yeah. Um, um, but anyway, so they, they, they're they handing out, and then at one point, uh, Bobby just, like, hands them out to the front row. Yeah, and, and they're, like, like, real flyers. And, and they're real flyers, and we grab one, and um, I'm going to let Rob read it, because right. he just has the best announcer voice, and this is just fucking hysterical. <laughs> Thank you. On, on one side it says, rise up. On the other side it says, revolution! Is your heart like a stallion? Are you ready to fight for what's right? If you used to be, yeah. if you used to be scared, we will unite to make it right. Your in town is a lie, a dark secret waiting to be exposed. Do not shrink from the dirty work they make us do in the name of profit and power. We have canyons of freedom ahead, a great expanse for your stallion heart to race through wild and free. Are you ready to join us? Their means to keep the poor in check until the day they die shall be over. Things are different now. We have the might. The days of suppression and oppression and depression are soon at their end. We have the plan to command respect and suppress the tyranny of the minority. May they drown in the pools of glory they made for themselves. Hmm. We will rise up and conquer the mighty profit machine, grinding our lives into penniless dust. What are you waiting for? Another musical number? Jump and pounce and dance your stallion heart out. We can resist the machine. It will rust in the waters of greed and despair. We all help make. The time is now to overturn UGC. Join us. We'll fight with all our might until we win somehow. That's a very confused message. Yeah, I have a feeling they just let Miko write it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Speaking of Miko, I thought he did a very good job in a kind of, you know, in a paradoxically thankless role as the protagonist. Because, mm -hmm. like, he's he does very well at being, like, the idealistic young man who is actually kind of a coward. And more than a bit of an idiot. Yeah. That's the thing, is, like, a lot of this play is about people who are kind of dumb. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's not an idiot plot. It's not an idiot no. plot. It's not an idiot plot because there are smart people in the play. Mm -hmm. They're just not the protagonists. <laughs> <laughs> the protagonists are kind of... Dumb. Dumb, like, beyond the realm of, like, poorly educated, which they're also poorly educated. It's just that they kind of have this weird idealistic streak... Like, even the, even the one who went to the most expensive university in the world, like, apparently, what, what did it, she's like, I might not have learned much at the most expensive university in the world, but I did learn... That kidnapping is, or that beating people is wrong. Yeah, it's like, really? They taught you that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's an, it's an odd <laughs> dynamic where, like, the protagonists, who are all good-hearted and idealistic, except they're not. Actually, because as good-hearted and idealistic as the leaders are, the actual rabble are basically murderous and dumb. Mm -hmm. Like a great combination. Yeah, easily led. I think is the might be the term, which is interesting. And like the 
the bad guys are not exactly smart either. Or they kind of are, but they've gone about things in a kind of a weirdly self, like short-sighted, self-centered way. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, anyway, continue. I just I've loved this show. Um, I want to do a little bit of background on it. Yeah, go for it. Um, so this show was off Broadway for a while, and it was in previews on Broadway, um, and was scheduled to open two days after nine eleven. Yes. Oops. Um, but it was a small enough show that they were able to just do three more weeks of previews and stay, you know, afloat and yeah. then do an official opening. Um, because not a lot of people are going to the theater, obviously. There's an alternate universe where this show got massive and Mamma Mia died in previews. I'd like to live in that universe. That's a much better universe. Yeah. Well, no, this show won. Let's see. It was nominated for one, two, three. Oh yeah, no. This this is a very I I would call this. It was like, nominated for nine Tonys and one. Um, let's see, it won best book of a musical, best original score, best direction. I feel like this and like Avenue Q kind of fall into the same like this was not intended to be an enormous hit, but something happened. Yeah, like early two thousands. This show is kind of weird, and it was never intended to. Be consumed by the masses, but yeah. it and, happened and it anyway. Never, uh, but it never got performed in a space that was too big for it. Yeah. So it stayed good and in demand. It, it would be like if Evil Dead Two was like the highest grossing film of that year, or if UHF had actually done what it was supposed to do and saved Orion Pictures and completely beat out Indiana Jones and Batman and all the other things it was up against. By the way, UHF is a great movie. You should all go watch it. It's yeah. got Weird Al Yankovic and Michael Richardson before we knew he was racist. Yeah. Um, but but my, my favorite thing about it being for, being Tony's, so um, it was nominated for Best Show, obviously. Um, it didn't win that year. Thoroughly Modern Millie did. But, so the original Bobby was played by Hunter Foster. Yeah. Whose sister is Sutton Foster who was Millie oh. in Thoroughly Modern Millie. Oh, man, that must have been an awkward-ass Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one like, of us is winning. Yeah. Or, wait, hold on. It's Thanksgiving before or after the Tonys? I guess, after, I guess we... At Tonys are in June. Okay, so the Tonys are in June, and then at Thanksgiving, I'm just imagining Sutton Foster sitting there stroking her Tony, going, Oh, what's that? What's that, Tony? I'm the talented one? Oh, thank you, Tony. <laughs> Pass the stuffing, won't you, Hunter? <laughs> Or something like that. I don't know. She's probably a nice person. <laughs> I know that if I had a Tony, I would never stop mentioning it, though. Well, will we have a lull for half a second. Yeah. I just want to mention how incredible and scarily well this show has aged. Mm. Wow. It started running in 2001. It is now 2019. And this show is even more relevant than it was then. The concepts in this show are so poignant mm-hmm. then and even more so now. And it, it it's developed into an in, in an interesting way where, like, I was thinking about this. The president, such as he is, you could read either of the Cladwells as being a metaphor for him. Because Cladwell, the Cladwell Sr. is, like, this weird, like, lecherous, greedy old man. Well, that, that was, like, his hair. And, and yeah. uh, like, like he had crazy, black hair, crazy but hair. it was in a familiar style, let's say. Yeah. yeah. But then we also have the kind of airheaded blonde that's full of nothing but platitudes and has no real plan and sees his power through what is effectively a violent coup and then yeah. runs it into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. It's It's kind of amazing how, like, you can just reframe these characters for the current climate. And that's, I think that's part of why it kind of, it helps to have such a like surreal stylized way of doing things. Like it's just sort of, it's so abstract almost that you can basically apply a lot of different lenses to it. Wherever, yeah. wherever there is, you know, corporate greed and systemic injustice, mm. read Insert the here. world. Yeah, you can basically slap it on there and be like, oh, you're in town. It's a metaphor for that. 
anyway. So I, I just discovered something that, that makes me kind of laugh a little Share bit. Share with the class. Yes, please. So um, the original Broadway officer lock stock was uh, Jeff McCarthy who Rob and I will remember as Grania's dad in Pirate Queen. Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. Oh, God. The fucking Pirate Queen. It's been so long. <laughs> I wasn't even there for that. That was... Oof, that was, that was like, the, the, low, the lowest... Uh, or like, the worst quality, like, sound quality episode we ever put up. Yeah, did we have to record that one on your phone? No, we recorded it on my, my laptop's on deck microphone, oh, that's right. okay. which sweet Jesus, I hope I haven't been doing that this whole time. No, I'm pretty sure it's not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had to record it on that, or not record. Had to. I just fucked up. Uh, and, spoilers, like, recorded it on I the was. wrong one, and we didn't want to do it all over again because we didn't want to watch the fucking pirate queen again. Yeah, who would want to watch that more than once? I didn't want to watch it once. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you for your sacrifice. <laughs> that, that was just that was an oddly bad show. Anyway, speaking of. None of that. This is an oddly good show, because it, I don't know, It part of it is that it's just fucking funny. It's so funny, oh it's, my god. It's one of the rare, like... Like, I was in this show, and I've seen it twice now, and I'm still laughing for most of the show. Yeah, it's it's a funny show, and it's just got, like, a lot of kind of, I don't want to say timeless humor, but, like, fairly timeless. Like, yeah. there's, it's not reliant on any sort of, like cultural norm right or any cultural knowledge even like yeah. you could show this you know with like, with like subtitles or a translator or something yeah. to you know some rando who's never been outside their house and they would probably find it funny yeah so one one thing so we attended the talkback like i said and um one of the questions asked was you know what is your favorite line in the show or a line that the audience doesn't pick up on that you think is fucking hilarious mm -hmm. um the f word is not used then no um and, other, and, so, and yeah. I found out Brandon O'Neill and I share the same favorite line, mm -hmm. um, which, which is after little Sally comes back in after she's seen Bobby die and goes, I don't think the meeting went very well. <laughs> and everyone's just like, well, what do you mean? Well, they threw him off a building. Pause. Well, is he OK? <laughs> oh. And I just every time that that just kills me. Yeah. And. But anyway, that leads into, um, this is a weirdly clean play as well. It is. Yeah, there's not a lot, there's no cussing. The, there there was one cuss that I noticed, and I think that might have just been ad lib. Uh, Mr. Queen, his actor. Um. Yeah, you, you got the. I got the program. Yeah. But anyway, he, like, at one point someone Nathan says. Nathaniel Tenenbaum. Nathaniel Tenenbaum. At, at one point, uh, like, the entire crowd you know, is going, oh, yeah, let's do this. And then someone says something to kind of take the wind out of their sails. And he just turned around. He was like right next to me. because I was in the front row. And he went, shit, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was an ad lib. That was though. probably an ad lib. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone is supposed to hear it. Yeah. So yeah, it's a clean show, not just in terms of like, I mean, there's a lot of talk about pee, but there's not really any toilet humor. No. Yeah. There's a lot of murder. I was going to say, and they never use the word piss either. No. They only say pee or... Relieving yourself or... or urinate or yeah. micturate or whatever. And then there's a lot of murder, but oh, it's... there's so much murder. But it's, in, but it's very euphemistically handled, yeah. both in universe and out. Our production had a thing where, like, uh, when Bobby Strong is thrown off the building... There's, like, a silhouette that goes down on, like, the screen in the back. And then an actual physical dummy just, like, drops onto the stage. And it, that was shocking. Yeah. Everyone was like, <gasps> I'm I'm like, like oh, they're using no. these screen. That's kind of cool. Oh, oh God. Dear. Yeah, no, like, that was, I didn't know how they were going to do that. Because when we did it, um, we actually had, um, like, Bobby get, like, thrown but he just stumbled into the center and just kind of stood on one foot and like slow motion falling as a wall came from the back of the stage God. and met him. Oh, that's cool. I like that. And it was it was really cool. Yeah. Like I love that effect. But like even even with that, like 
But the dummy falling was the dummy was falling was great, and then they like literally just some like stage hand with a cane, yep. literally like the, gives the him, hook. It was literally yeah, the, literally the, the gives hook. him the hook. <laughs> it's like just oh, you're done. Reaches out and grabs it and pulls it off stage. Exit stage dead. <laughs> <laughs> but like so, that's the only on on um, stage murder, and like there's no cussing. There's like I said, no toilet humor. That's why it, it's so popular with high schools. I bet because mm-hmm. it's yeah. like. You're in town. That's kind of subversive. Like ooh. high schools and colleges and all sorts of performing arts organizations do this show all the time. Yeah, and unlike with other plays where like you need to remove the the you know the sex or the hookers. Yeah, there's Plain is. <laughs> sex and the hookers, and like half of the runtime because Jesus Christ, that plays long. Um, no, usually the runtime's about the same. Oh Lord, how? You you really you just change a couple of lyrics and make the hookers wear full shirts. <laughs> that just the hookers are actually just seamstresses in this version. Yeah. She had to sell her hair to make a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> a sweater out of her hair? Yeah. Uh there's a lady in my hometown. This is an amazing tangent. Uh, a lady in my hometown who makes hair sweaters out of dog hair. Uh Why? Uh here's the thing. Golden retriever fur is so soft. My mom has a like an ear warmer made from the hair of our old golden retriever. It is so comfy and so soft. It's mildly morbid. A little bit. I'm, it was alive when, when the earmuffs were made. I know, but now like you, just, you, coll- you You collect it after you brush them. Yeah, you brush them. I know that. Just, yeah. I'm just saying the fact that you own something. Man, you think that's morbid. Let me tell you what else she made for us. Uh, so that, that dog uh, ran away to live with a nearby Scotsman. Not a joke. And uh, we got a, a black lab named Lucky. And I, I love Lucky very much. He is sadly deceased. But because black lab hair is really coarse and uncomfortable, she made a stuffed dog that sh- shaped like Lucky out of Lucky's hair. Oh. And we still have that. Oh. <laughs> so, yes. I never want to go there ever. <laughs> uh, I can show you the spot in the yard where he's buried. <laughs> he's a sweet guy. Really bad at being a dog, though. Like, wouldn't fetch, wouldn't swim, would barely run. He just liked napping in the sun. He just liked napping on a couch, honestly. We had a couch that just, we eventually had to just throw away. Because, the, the, like, after Lucky died, it was like, well, this couch is fucking ruined. <laughs> this couch just smells like dog forever <laughs> throughout. It was a sleeper couch, too. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, anyway. Anyway. That's a tangent. Back from that tangent. Um, shit, what were we talking about? So, where were we? I, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in with this score is deceptively hard. Yeah, they were saying that it's a very hard score, and I'm, I was just, uh, like, I'm not especially good at, like, recognizing how difficult music is by ear, unless it's, like, a guitar solo. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they were saying it's very difficult in the talk back, and I, I can kind of see why. Yeah, like, some of the songs, like, are, are pretty simple, but then, like, listen, like, Run Freedom Run. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, you know, basically a gospel number. Yeah. But think about how many different time signatures they go through in the course of that song. That's true. And so then they're many. just the entire acapella bit. Yeah, where, where they literally, like, get on stairs like a gospel yeah. choir. And, like, they, they they spend a good, like, 15 seconds warming up. Yeah. <laughs> Which is and great. It, it, it's really funny. And then also, um, You're in Town, the song that Lockstock starts with, with the rhythmic bit, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. And I was in the show. Same. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's a long, slow, tumble of a journey, worthy of a gurney, bumble down, something like that. Yeah. It's an incredible song, but I'm like, dear lord, it's so difficult. God, I'm just thinking about this. Like, I'm not sure how much of, like, You're in Town... I mean, You're in Town's, like, in many ways, kind of a parody of other musicals. Like, yeah. Their whole revolution bit is definitely a parody of Les Miserables. Yeah. Because, like, instead of being like, you know, oh, we are revolutionaries, we will fight for freedom, it's like, I don't know, man, I just want to pee. Like, yeah. well, uh, it sounds then, like it's going to be hard. Well, well, and then, let's, the, I don't want to do that, that's hard. I don't, the flyer thing, though, like, I was immediately reminded of Newsies. That's the other thing, is like, you, you, you just give, throw a 
bad Brooklyn accent on Bobby Strong, and boom. Yeah, like they he's, had the blue shirt and the hat and everything. Yeah, he's shilling papes down by the Bowery or whatever. But, but then I, I, I was just like, but no, Newsies didn't come out until like 2011, but then the original film. The original film, yeah. I but to like, be fair, like it doesn't sound like uh, Christian Bale failing to do an American accent, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I always forget that he's Welsh. Yeah. And he's gotten way better at doing an American accent. Yeah. But like, so I'm I'm kind of unclear about how much of it is them parodying other musicals and other musicals being influenced by them. Because like I like musicals before 2001, like chances are like they are parodying them. After 2001, any reference made to a musical after that is a decision by the creative team. Well, what I'm yeah, true. I feel like I'm I might be like. Uh, lacking in knowledge, though, but, like, wh- what you just did, the uh, start of Urine Town, yeah. really reminded me of the end of The Devil's Carnival. <laughs> Ooh. Tongues, tongues, slither in the mud. That's how a carnival grows, my son. That that whole bit. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even think of that until I was gonna now. say, but that's also a pretty common musical thing. True, but considering, you know, Urine Town's, like, a sleeper, like, the underground favorite of, you know, yeah, like, I would imagine Terrence Sedanik has seen You're in Town. Yeah, he's probably done You're in Town. Probably. Yeah. What's um, that guy up to? Who knows? Well, Making well, Repo 2, I was gonna Genetic say, Harder. <laughs> Devil's Carnival 2 was the last thing I remember. Yeah. Um, Which is a good movie, actually. Yeah, doesn't it have David Hasselhoff in it? Yep, and Adam Pascal. Okay. Hmm. Does anyone attempt in any way, shape, or form to hassle the Hoff? Oh, yeah. mm. I don't. I, I was. I was paying more attention to Adam Pascal. Sure. Match. <laughs> Surprising no one. Surprising no one. He's the reason I watched the movie. Yeah. Fair. Um. Anyway. Uh. Anything else we have to say about you're in town? Aside from you should probably go see it if it's playing in your town. If you live in Seattle, definitely go see it. Yeah. It runs through June. Yeah. Um. It's already extended twice. Yep. Just because it is selling so well. I'm glad. It, Rightfully so. It, it, do, it does my heart good to see a like good production of a good play doing well, as opposed yeah. to like you know, a good production, which is basically all we get of garbage. Mm-hmm. My mom likes this show, so like, go see it. And that's the thing is like, it's it's a show that literally anyone can enjoy. Yeah. Like there's there's there were some old people who left at the first, after the, at intermission last night. I did notice. It's old people. Old people. Yeah, these are the same people who are going to complain about Stu for Silverton. I don't know what that is. Oh, um, it's a musical that got produced at Intamon a few years ago. Fifth is doing it in their next season. Um, it is about Stu Rasmussen, who was the first transgender mayor elected in the U.S. Oh, cool. Uh, in the town of Silverton, Oregon. Oh, okay. And um, the town is really the hero of the story because it's them coming to accept Stu and defends you against the fucking Westboro Baptist Church. Ooh, Sounds neat. like it's going to be dope. I'm so excited. I can't wait for the old people to be like... And it's Bang. happening during uh, Transgender Awareness Month. Huh. Well, of course it is. Yeah. I mean, it would be kind of weird if it didn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Neat. So probably look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Basically, if it's a show that pisses off rich old white people, I am here for it. Yep. Mood. <laughs> yeah. Big mood. I was going to say, like... Is it possible for a musical to have big dick energy? Because I feel like this show might have big dick energy. I think yeah. you're right. I was yeah. going to say, Comedia would have more big dick energy. But that's a really long involved joke that probably no one gets but me. Part, so I mean, part probably of, someone will get it, but okay, whatever. Okay, so part of... I'll, I'll explain a little bit. So Comedia is like the old... um, Like, Italian... Comedia dollar tech. Yeah, Comedia dollar tech. Yeah. Um... And it's usually done with masks. And in the original incarnation, before it was, you know, all taboo, they would have giant fake penises. Okay. And the more ridiculous the penis, the funnier it was. So it's kind of like no plays, where, like, everyone has, like... The, well, I mean, the, grand... the no masks? What? No, I, yeah. I, I'm thinking specifically of uh, the... Are they Tengu? The Tengu with the, like, long, yeah. phallic-ass noses? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a proud tradition of just... Dick humor going yeah, back in old theater. Yeah, tiny people sometimes. No, yeah. I, they're, so they're, I have a, it's, it's, it's I kind have of, a story yeah. um, about Comedia. So my university, we have a unit on Comedia. And um, we use the penises. I mean, Comedia had lots of units going. 
Uh, no one can see, my, but I'm Kermit facing it, Rob. Um, no one can see my enormous fake penis. Um, but so part of Commedia was like, you would build your mask and you would build your penis. Um, and so my, my group got this idea to make our spin. The, okay, as long as they would spin and also play the Space Jam theme. No. <laughs> <laughs> I need to make that now. Y'all ready for this? <laughs> but no, it, it during performance it failed so badly. Did it fly off and hit someone in the eye? <laughs> no, it started smoking. Oh my god, that's worse. <laughs> but the audience just fucking loved it. Well, no shit. You had a smoking fake dong on stage. That's not something you and, see and every day. And the actor was totally fine. Like, Good. Good, because that could cause problems <laughs> with his actual Del Arte unit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you ever have a chance to go see a Comedia Del Arte, just anywhere, go do it. It's very fun. Gotcha. So they, do they still do the penis thing? Um, Depends on the company. Okay. So I, I would want to find a... a Penis-friendly. A, a bedonged <laughs> Comedia. Yeah. Yeah. So, are we to infer here that, like, ancient Italians were just kind of walking around with their knobs out so that they could be, like, more easily portrayed in Commedia dell'arte? Uh. Probably. I mean, Italians, you know. Well. Yeah. Gotta love them. Mm-hmm. Making Naki and making Nookie. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks, I hate it. Well, maybe both. <laughs> just eating Naki off each other's dang- dangles. No, 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 no. <laughs> nope, right out of that one. Not hot enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out. Have you guys seen uh, um, Del Amore, Del Morte? No. It's got, no. it's got Rupert Everett in it. It's uh, like, it's kind of, this is a tangent, but it's based on uh, Dylan Dog, the series of um, like Italian comic books. Mm-hmm. And it's basically about a dude whose job, he lives in Italy in this like weird Italian village, and his job is to just shoot all the zombies that come out of the cemetery. <laughs> And, okay. Yeah, like, and he basically just regards it as like an inconvenience at work, <laughs> and his biggest like like at at first his main thing is that he keeps trying to expense his bullets oh and they God. and they keep not doing it. <laughs> they keep not giving him his expense back. <laughs> Sorry, go see Delamore Delamore. It's a cr- it's a crazy weird movie. It's got um, I think... sex and death and stuff. All the be- all, all the good things. All the good stuff. Yeah. How old is it? Uh, like the. 80s or early okay. 90s. That's way back. Uh, it was it was called uh, Cemetery Man in America because we can't have nice things. We can never have nice things. Yeah, like except this show. Except this show, you're in town. Boom, massively brought it back. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're in town. Do we have anything else we want to specifically say aside from that? Like, I thought the casting was really good. I loved the set for this show. Yes. Oh my god. That is another thing. Go ahead and talk I just, about it. It's sparse, but it works. And they, oh, I'm trying to like explain no it without over set, without over explaining it. Yeah. What like, would you describe the set that they have? Yeah. So essentially, they built this set of stairs essentially along the back of the stage that it come out like this into scaffolding. A, kind yeah. Of. Yeah, and they and it comes out over the stage at one point. Yeah, and like a point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically like there's a staircase going up to the rafters and then down and out on top of the stage. So, like, if it collapsed, all the actors below would be fucked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, but it didn't, so that's good. Yeah. Um, and they then it goes. stop the show for unrelated reasons. Yeah, that was a technical hiccup, and yeah. we shouldn't hold it against them. No, no, I'm not holding it against them. Yeah. I thought it was handled quite well. It was, and it also gave us the opportunity to see the. Uh, the bit where he's like, "You gotta get your head out of the clouds, boy!" And like as he as she physically wrestles his head to the ground twice, <laughs> yeah. which made me so happy that we got to see it again. Yeah, like the first time I was sitting there and I was just like, "There should be underscoring here." I didn't even miss it. I was just like, and, and "Oh, this well, is great." You, you've never seen it. True, but yeah. um, and and so and then like she runs over and they're going on and like he's about to start singing even though there's no orchestra. He's like, "Fuck it, I guess we'll do it live." Yeah, and then. Like, someone over the intercom goes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to hold for a few minutes. We have lost the orchestra. Yeah. Which, Actors, please go backstage. Which led to the thought of, like, the entire orchestra sitting, like, standing on a weird, like, some random street corner in Seattle going, like, how did we get here? Weren't we supposed to be doing something? 
Yeah, I, I feel I should mention the orchestra is four people. Which, it, they make it work. They make oh, yeah. it sound yeah. really big. The, condu- the conductor is uh, RJ Tanchioko. Who's also a mensch. He was he was at the talk back, yeah. looming in the background like yeah. a phantom of the opera. Um, um, and then trombone, bass trombone, and euphonium is Stuart Hamley. Reeds, clarinet, bass clarinet, soprano sax, alto sax, Dewey Marler. And percussion, drums, general percussion, Chris Monroe. General. That was the entire instrumentation for that show. And it just worked really well. Yeah, it's oh, so good. When, when I when I first came in, I thought I was like, oh, are are they just gonna like have one dude with a synthesizer? Because like I could see an orchestra pit, but just like one guy's head kind of going like yeah. peaked up over it. Yeah, just a conductor. But no, they're just under the stage, which yep. is kind of brilliant. Yeah. But yeah, back to the set for a minute. You have that, this amazing scaffolding with us, which as we and behind it, as we sort of mentioned, there are screens. Yeah. And as well along. Um, above on one side like one part of the ceiling because when i saw the show i was over farther back and similar things probably projected on the back were also projected there Mm -hmm. so that everyone can see you know secret hideout or you're in good company um and then on stage other than occasionally uh miss penny wise's little table or any kind of other props brought out on stage the only other thing on stage is the most incredible cool. broken toilet memorial like an altar thing. like an altar yeah. of broken toilets just this these busted ass chunks of plumbing like creating this like pyramid with all these all these little surfaces that yeah. provided so many pieces of like little business for people to do yeah like, people standing or sitting or, right like there's a toilet moved, up front yeah and it gets tied to it and back <laughs> and there's like Places in the back to stand so that Bobby Strong and who or whoever can basically do the Les Mis parody. Yeah, they literally had like a roll of toilet paper on a stick that someone was waving behind during um the the was it uh, Run Freedom Run? No, no. it was Look to the um, Sky. Act One Finale. Act okay. one, all right, Act One Finale, which is just called that because it literally has Officer Lockstock going like, "Well, that's it for Act One." At yep. some point in the middle, we can't catch them because we're all moving so damn slowly. Yeah, <laughs> and then. My last thing about the set, one of my, like, favorite things is in Act 2, when they're coming in and out of the secret hideout, um, Pennywise and Bobby and Josephine climb out of and into the orchestra pit. Yeah. There's just a little ladder there. Yep. I love it. It's it's pretty great. Uh, Yeah, it's just really solid, like, minimalist design that doesn't feel like kind of classic, you know... Oh, we have to mine the thing. Yeah, it's like, and there's something always there for them to physically interact with. It's just that it isn't necessarily what you're actually seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Although there's also just like the physical door yeah. into uh, uh public amenity number nine. Public amenity number nine. Which okay, they said it was a urinal. There were a lot of women lined up to go to a urinal. I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's the future. You you pee where you can. Yeah. And you can only pee in urinals because it's illegal to pee otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I feel like we've... I think we've pretty much done yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I gotta say, uh, Officer Lockstock and Officer Barrel both had excellent mustache game. Mm-hmm. Although apparently uh, uh, B.O.N.'s wife is very much looking forward to him shaving his mustache off. Oh, Brandon O'Neill. Yeah. yeah. He talked about that in the talkback about, like... And he it, he paints on the little curly cues for the mustache. Oh, so yeah. he has like <laughs> the twirly mustache. Like he has a, he has a physical mustache, but he also has like the painted on one to make it look yeah. just extra weird and kind of unnatural. Yeah, he he made a comment about yeah yeah they made me grow this mustache and um, my wife hates it. Mm-hmm. She she can't wait until I shave it off. Yeah. Also, th- this is a funny thing I noticed at one point in the play that just their like fascist gear is just literally. Dickies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, like he, we were close enough that, like, he, he stands, like, two feet away from us at one point. There's just a little Dickies label on his trousers. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's funny. And, and they sewed on the, the ribbons on the outside. Yeah. Good costume design, too. Yeah, oh, yeah I, for sure. Like, as I was saying, like, all of the rich people are cartoonishly, like, they're literally characters yeah. of rich people. Melanie Taylor Burgess. Good did job, awesome her. costume design. Yeah, she did a great job. Yeah, all of the aesthetic of this show, the costumes, the set yeah. design. Martin Christoffel, who did scenic design, also amazing job. Oh, shit. One other thing uh, is that, like, all of the um, all of the projected images, and, images stuff. and stuff were really good. Like, they kind of reminded me a bit of, like, 
both 60s Hanna-Barbera cartoons and, like, oh, fuck, what's the name of that guy? The guy that does the, uh, like, Saul Bass opening oh. credit sequences from, like, the 30s through the 70s. Okay. Yeah, like, like Hitchcock did a lot, had a lot of Saul Bass oh, yeah. openings and so forth. And also the best movie ever, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, had a uh, Saul Bass okay. style opening. And the lighting design was Robert Aguilar, and sound design was uh, Justin Stasio. Well, oh, good for them. So let's let's rate this thing, shall we? Yeah. And as we as we have established earlier, our rating system is entirely freeform. You can have as many categories as you want and rate it out of anything, out of anything else, or even non out of anything. You can. I think we had emojis once. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to go first? Um, I think there's no one reason with emojis. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, five fire escapes out of five. Sorry, three fire alarms. Yeah. Um, let's see. I just I love this show so much. Um, I just gotta give it like. Acting ten out of ten. Like, I I don't feel like there's any place anyone could have tightened it up anymore. Yeah. Okay. I I, I will say, however, that like, it, it's your rating. I'm not gonna say you should change it, but like me personally, you're doing something real big, and that's fine. But there's nothing like especially transcendent to me. Like they were all very good. Yeah. But there's never I was like, oh man, I'm looking at the next big thing. Well, I just, like, I, we also come from different backgrounds when it comes to this stuff. True. Um, but I just, like, having been in the production and seen what it looks like when it's, like, sloppy and yeah. done by college kids. Um, I'll agree with that, yeah. This was just so tight, and the comedic timing was just so perfect, and, like, there was not a wasted beat in the show. Mm -hmm. And I I really appreciate that. I, I really just, I appreciate the costume design as well. Like, I really, really love it. And I'm just, I'm terrible at rating right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Want to come back to you? Yeah. All right. I give this show 8.7 out of 10. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's, it. that's, that's a very good rating, I, yeah. I would say. Like, it's not my favorite play. I, I really liked it, though. And I, I think everyone should go see it. I, I think it's, like, just a really... It, it, even if even if it was poorly executed, which it wasn't, it was executed very well. Even if it was, though, it would be such a weird cultural artifact that I would say that everyone should go see it. Mm -hmm. But it is well executed, so that's a, a fun bonus. Yeah. Yeah. I... I uh, eight comedian del arte dongs out of eight. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a scale of, like... A plus actors, um, because part of it said is like the only like actual dancer in the show is Sarah Rose Davis. Mm. Everyone else is just actors who can ah. dance, kind of. Actors who can be instructed on how to dance. Yeah, and the the choreographer Charlie Johnson did an amazing job with making everybody look at the same level. That's true. Yeah. And like there there was no like there's a, there's a couple of chorus numbers where everyone's dancing. Yeah. And there's no point where you're going, oh, that person is definitely better than the rest of the cast. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it's hard to do, harder than you'd think. And I... I would assume it's quite hard. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And, and just also that the actors were able to all get that in sync with each other. I mean, with a small cast, it's easier than large cast, but... It's true. Yeah. I just... You know, hard eyes, hard eyes. Yeah, that's about it. Eggplant smiley face. <laughs> For the Commedia dell'arte. Uh, yeah, the other tango mask emoji. Yeah. Oh, you're right. That is a thing. I forgot. <laughs> Oof, uh. All, right, All right, Lane, what do you think? I give this show a B plus with honors just because I have such a wonderful connection with this show. I love it so much. I loved doing it even though I was in high school. And it was not the greatest production on the planet, but I love it. And it was one of the first shows that I ever did. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's so, it's such an important show. It's so much better. And I don't know what word I'm looking for here. Then everyone assumes it to be. Transcendent? 
Yeah, I guess that's, that's, I guess that's what I'm looking for. But yeah, it's just, it's such an incredible show. And I, I want more people to give it a shot because it is so worth it. Yeah. And on that note, I, one other thing I, I would like other people to give a shot at writing an original musical like this. Because mm-hmm. like, uh, we were, we were talking after the show, like, so many musicals are like adaptations of movies or books and they really don't need to be. You can you can make an original musical and you can make it successful. You can make it enduring. This is a successful enduring original musical and we need more of that. Mm-hmm. Not like a jukebox musical, not, you know, Rambo the musical. Never mind. Make Rambo the musical. I want that. Do that. We already have Rocky. I know. I'm saying it's within the realm of possibility. <laughs> Especially if you have to do, like, every lead actor has to do an over-the-top Stallone impression. <laughs> I would Please. watch the shit out of that. Um. I didn't spill first blood. They did. They spilled first blood. I would watch the shit out of that. <laughs> I think we all would. Yep. Especially the rap break. <laughs> <laughs> Still in Stallone voice. <laughs> Which I'm not even going to attempt. <laughs> Or, or the DJ duel break. Yeah, you have to have the DJ duel at the end. <laughs> anyway, so I would say like this is a this is a call to action. Make more original musicals. I want I want more of them. Like, Please. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, uh, one more thing. Ooh, one more um, thing. we are working on a few other episodes. Yeah, by working on. I mean, I'm mostly done. I'm just, I, I just didn't release them for whatever reason. Uh, hopefully, this will come out very soon. I'm planning to do this quickly. Good. And yeah, we'll probably release them later. Uh, we have, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna say what they are, but um, we have a couple in the coming hole. in the future. They, they're gonna be less relevant now, but they'll still be relevant to the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <sighs> anyway, uh, I think. This has been Let's Put on a Show. Uh, so, yeah, I have been Rob. I'm Sabra. I'm Lane. And go break some legs. Some original legs. Yeah. Chicken legs. Yeah. Mm, turkey legs. Ooh. Ooh. You know that the, uh, the turkey legs at Disney World are actually male turkey legs. And that's why they're so enormous. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because they're male turkeys got getaway sticks like a, like a leg of lamb. And that's how we're ending this. Let's Put On The Show is a production of Blood and Thunder Publications, all rights reserved. Our entrance and exit music is Ragamama by Purple Planet Music. Hail Malthus, have a nice day. <laughs>